All right, so here we have a box, and in this box is the new Dayton Audio 408 digital signal processor. Uh, and we're going to open it up and check it out. All right, so I've actually been through this and looked at it, but for video purposes, I wanted to uh, start over. So, here we have uh, the box. I'll open it up. We got the manual, uh, the DSP, we have a 12 volt separate power supply, which is, I think, a really nice feature. What this would allow you to do is use it for a home audio setup or if you want to set the DSP up outside of your car uh, in the comfort of your own home, you can plug this in, power up the DSP, hook it up to your laptop or use the Bluetooth dongle uh, in your phone or iPad and um, set everything up before you even install it in the car. Nice feature. And then we have um, the USB internet interconnect cable. Looks like a couple of brackets, uh, some double-sided tape and some screws. And the uh, DSP. So there you have it. Dayton Audio. If you can see that, it has a nice uh, brushed aluminum finish on there. Looks like an anodized black. Uh, we have our um, RCA inputs, Tiffany style. Uh, that's pretty nice for a $150 digital signal processor. Uh, we have the USB input. We have the funnel jack style uh, input for the uh, remote control. This is the DC input. Uh, we have a switch here with a power light, indicator light. Um, so it looks like we have speaker level inputs, RCA inputs, and I'm not sure what that is. And then the uh, power input and speaker level input connector, which I actually have installed in the car already because I've been playing around with this. So on the output side, we have um, the USB input for the Bluetooth dongle, and then each one of these is a separate uh, left or right channel. You actually have um, four uh, channels of output, or eight individual outputs, and again on the input, uh, you only have two. But um, if you're a typical, um, um, you know, front stage uh, car audio install, that's all you need. Okay, so for comparison purposes, um, I'm going to make references and comparisons to uh, a DSP that I've been using for over a year now, uh, and that's the JL Audio uh, Tweak 88. Uh, this is a fantastic digital signal processor. Uh, obviously costs a lot more um, it's about four hundred and thirty dollars but you know it's it's JL audio and it does have uh, quite a bit more input and output options uh, but not necessarily something that the average uh, tuner is going to use um, but for the purpose of this video uh, I want to use this as sort of a benchmark to compare it with um, and take into consideration the large price difference. Um, okay, so with the Dayton Audio 408 DSP, um, you have an option of purchasing uh, a wired remote control and also a Bluetooth dongle. Uh, a wired remote control is about $20.00. Uh, and the Bluetooth dongle is about $30. So that brings the total price of this uh, package up to $200. Um, and for a DSP 
with these specifications and these capabilities, that's uh, a new benchmark as far as DSPs are concerned in the market. Uh, that's why this is so important. So we have here a remote control. So it has the uh, phonotype jack interconnect. It actually looks a little scratched here, but uh, I know that's just a film on the front to protect it. And it has a nice feel to it. It has these little detents or um, clicks built into it. It kind of feels like a factory, uh, like a decent factory radio. When you turn it, it doesn't feel cheap at all. Not sure how to hook this up, but uh, we'll figure that out. And then uh, for $30, you get the Bluetooth dongle. Nothing special to see here. So there it is. Comes with a little protective cap on it. So that would just plug right into the back of the DSP like that. supposed to allow you to stream music directly into this DSP and um, also uh, use an, an app on the Android or Apple device uh, as the interface for tuning the DSP. Okay for comparison purposes um, the Dayton DSP measures about six and five eighths of an inch long the JL audio about five and a quarter of an inch height about three and five eighths of an inch JL audio four and a quarter depth Dayton DSP inch and a sixteenth JL audio inch and seven eighths. Okay, so here is the app on my Apple iPad. And um, first time using it, just trying to figure it out. All right, so this is the, the app. Uh, the Bluetooth dongle is connected. If you just try and connect to it, it won't find it. So what you have to do is go to the settings uh, and use the Bluetooth function on your uh, device. Do a search and it's coming up right here. Click on it and connect to it. Now it says connected. So then we should go back to the app and it should recognize, there it is. So we just click on that. You'll see that the power indicator symbol, right, it's showing that it's synchronizing and that went from red to green. So now I know that this app is connected to the DSP through the Bluetooth streaming dongle uh, in a, to the iPad. Um, and as you can see here, um, I had previously loaded uh, a preset and now it's showing up here on my iPad. I, you can see that it's labeled as Celestian SB. Well, those are the two types of drivers I have in the car right now. Um, so that's kind of a nice feature. So I can see that uh, my preset one is, is there. Um, so let's see what happens if I click on it. So I'll recall it. And we can go to advanced settings. Um, 
got a delay. So you can see I already loaded the uh, delay for my drivers in. Um, again, so channel one has um, 42 inches. So right now I have it on the inch uh, selection. You can have centimeters and, and also time or milliseconds. All right, so here I'm going to show you the uh, app on my uh, iPad and also the um, wired remote. So on the wired remote, uh, it, pre it defaults to the volume setting. So this is a master volume. Um, and like I mentioned before, the feel of this knob with the little detent so you can kind of see when I do that, it's each time it does that, that's a detent. Um, nice little feel to it. Uh, it also has presets or preset mode. So what you do is you push on this, that changes it to the preset mode. And then as you see, as I turn it, it has six different presets. So you can do a tune, save it to preset one, do a different tune, save it to preset two, and then go back and forth between the two and compare them and see what the difference in sound is. You may like, for example, um, a 12 dB high pass, low pass, or band pass crossover versus a 24 dB Liquids Rally. Um, and you could just toggle between those two and see, see how they sound. Or you may want uh, your crossover from your woofer to your tweeter. Um, to be like 2500 Hertz versus 3000. Um, you can try different time alignments, time alignment settings, um, anything you want. Uh, and you can do a direct comparison between those two with these presets. Or you could set um, the time alignment for when it's just you in the vehicle on preset one, so it's optimized for the driver. Uh, and if you have a passenger and you want them to have a little bit better imaging, you could set the time alignment differently so that um, you know, it works better for them. Uh, some basic, a basic overview of this. Um, so at the bottom, well, let me start uh, yeah, at the bottom here. Okay. Um, so I, I had already went ahead on the, my laptop and loaded a preset. And what you're seeing here is the delay. And you're seeing it uh, shown in inches. So right now it's the, the green square here is, is indicating that all of these uh, numbers here are in inches. Uh, it's channel one, two, three, four. I, I'm not using five and six and seven and eight. Channel one and two are my tweeters. Channel three and four are my midwoofers. Uh, that, that consists of my front stage and then seven and eight are for the subwoofer. All right, so if we go to the EQ, all right, you can see here, um, there's a little graph. Uh, it's showing uh, what EQ has been applied in graphic form. And then we have uh, our 10 bands of, these are actually parametric equalizers, all right? So for each one, if you click on it, it'll highlight. Here it has the attenuation. All right, so number one is minus 6.9 dBs. The Q is 1.983, and the frequency, or the target frequency for that is 137 hertz. And there's two, so minus 1.8 uh, for attenuation. The Q, or well the, the, the shape of the uh, slope at the 476 hertz frequency is 0.999, and so on. Now I went, like I said, I went, this is uh, <clears throat> what I did when I uh, did my initial tune. I used Room EQ Wizard with a uh, mini DSP microphone, 
and auto EQ. That's how I came up with these numbers. Uh, channel one and two, like I said before, you can see uh, the tweeters. Um, channel three uh, is the left midwoofer. Channel four is the right midwoofer. Five and six I did not use. You can see it's just flat. And seven and eight are linked together. Um, I did that on the software for the PC, which um, for some of you, uh, you may not know this, you will, you will find out. Uh, just like most apps, um, they're sort of limited in comparison to the software for the PC. Um, they're sort of a simplified, simplified version of it. You can still do everything you can with the, uh, the PC, but it's not um, as extensive. Uh, there are a few less things. I can compare that later on. <clears throat> All right, so there's your EQ section. Uh, then you have the output section. Uh, this is where we set our crossovers. Um, so we have, let's go to channel one, that's the tweeter. That's the left tweeter, so I have a Lakewitz Riley crossover. Um, this is actually, these are actually full range drivers, so that's why you see 1500 hertz for the high pass filter, which means that it, everything 1500 hertz and up uh, passes by, everything below that is attenuated at a slope of 24 dBs per an octave. Um, so there's my left tweeter, my right tweeter, there's my left midwoofer. Uh, here you can see I have a high pass filter at 62 hertz and a low pass filter at 1500 hertz which corresponds with the tweeters. So this is a band pass because we have a, a high pass and a low pass on one driver. So there's your left midwoofer, my right midwoofer. Um, again, five and six are not used in the DSP. And then there's my subwoofer. Um, and here you can see um, I have the low pass set to 75 hertz, 24 dB per octave with a Butterworth filter on it. Uh, and channel eight should be the same because they're linked. Then we have the mixer. Um, so these are the input channels, one through four, which correspond to the input here. So we've got one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, and four. Um, and you can see which output channel it's connected to. So we'll go to channel one, that's my tweeter. That's connected to input one, which is right here. And that's the left channel. We'll go to channel two, okay. Um, channel two is right there. That is the right channel. So that's uh, the, the input channels I use for my tweeter that come from my head unit. Um, and the way the app works is, um, if I wanted channel one to be that, I would just turn this down, turn that up, and then just switch to input one. Um, and I'll play with this later, but looks like you can mix and match them too. Not sure how that's going to work yet, but we'll, we'll find out. All right, so let's see. Uh, channel three. All right, so that's, we're selecting three as the output, and we're connecting it to, in this case, channel input one again, because that's my source. All right, so like I said before, that's my left midwoofer, right, my right midwoofer. You can see as I go from left to right, it corresponds with left and right. All right typically on, well I shouldn't say, it's typically for me. I always use red as right and white as left. It's all completely up to you guys, but that's the way I like to do it. Um, and then I can't make a mistake because I always do the same thing. I do that with my amplifiers, my DSPs, my head units, you know, whatever I'm using. If it's uh, a white and a red, which is very common, red is right, white is left.
Um, so again, five and six are not used. Seven uh, is the subwoofer channel. The left side and the right side, channel eight is the subwoofer channel. And you can attenuate uh, these. They should, let's see, that should be the same on seven because they're linked. Okay, it's not. So the app's a little different. All right, so that's a basic overview of uh, how the app works. And then there's our presets again. There's your master volume. Pretty simple. Um, take eight. All right, so um, I've been playing with this uh, Dayton Audio DSP for a couple of weeks off and on. I've actually haven't had a lot of time uh, play with it, but um, this isn't really a con, but it's something I want to point out um, because this is going to affect uh, where you put this in your car. Uh, it's just like you know any other electronic device. You don't want to put it where it's going to get uh, where it's going to overheat. All right, so <clears throat> ambient temperature in this garage right now, using my laser thermometer, is about 78. Uh, and if I shoot the DSP, we're looking at 100 degrees. Uh, this thing has been on for about half an hour. There's about a 20 degree delta right there. Um, you know, the inside of a car, especially if you live in a hot climate, can get pretty hot. Uh, I don't know how this will affect it. It's probably fine, but uh, take this into consideration when you're placing this DSP. You probably want to put it in a location where it's not in direct sun or, you know, in, a, in a, an area where the sun heats it up and can cause it to overheat. Uh, make sure it has uh, ample cooling or space around it so it can stay cool. All right, so um, one of the things I want to, uh, I want to point out is, and I learned this from the software with the JL Audio Tweak 88. Um, if you're not careful when you're tuning and setting your um, high and low pass filters uh, with your, especially your tweeters, um, you can accidentally send a full range signal to your tweeter. And if you have high power amplifiers, it won't last very long. Uh, you can easily ruin a set of nice tweeters. So. As a precaution, you should do this with all active systems, uh, is to get, I'm going to show you this really cheap uh, factory tweeter. Uh, I actually use this uh, setup to find, well, when I tune my amps, um, to find a distortion uh, as I set the gain. I'll explain that another time. but. Um, so I use uh, an inline capacitor, or cap as a lot of people refer to it. Um, depending on the ohm reading of your driver, um, you can go online and use online calculators and try and figure out how many UFs, uh, or what size capacitor uh, and capacity, non-polarized, uh, you need. But if you, what you wanna do is install one of these inline where the uh, cutoff frequency is lower than what you're going to use uh, in the DSP for a cutoff frequency, but not too low. Um, what this will do is add a little extra protection so that, let's just say for example, all right, let me disconnect this. Let's say for example, I'm going through my presets and I didn't do anything with the other presets and I accidentally turned it to a preset that sends a full range signal to my tweeters. I just blew my tweeters. So with that capacitor in line with your tweeters, that's probably gonna save them. So it's just a good thing to do for um, all active setups. This is not just Dayton Audio specific. Although I will say that JL Audio's uh, software, anytime you make a change, 
uh, where that could happen, it automatically mutes the signal. So you're less likely to have a problem with the JL audio software. Um, all right, so here is just a basic overview of the PC software. A um, little bit larger interface, you can see more at once. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, a uh, few more options on there, just a little easier to, to use. I recommend when you're setting it up um, and if you're trying to, trying to get to know the software, to start with this first. Um, so here we have uh, channel one, uh, that's my tweeter, my left tweeter. You can see up here the graph showing my uh, my tune basically. All the different numbers represent the parametric filters 1 through 10. It has 10 filters per channel. This is exactly the same as the JL Audio tweaks, so it's just as powerful. Um, graphically, you know, it, I like how this is set up. Uh, you can see, you know, what's happening visually. Um, which is just a nice feature. Um, JL Audios does the same thing, but you have to uh, click on a, a bar to see it. Um, but basically it's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so you, you have uh, your low pass filter, your high pass filter. Uh, let's go to channel three. All right, so channel three, uh, this is my left midwoofer. If I click on the high pass filter, which is set at 62 Hertz, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little blue shaded area there. Um, that, let's see. Can you see that in the film? I hope you can. So it shows you how uh, the the higher the low pass filter shapes the the uh, actual curve or how it how it's shaped. All right, so let's just see if I change from a Lightwoods Rally to a Butterworth, you can see how that changed and how the slope changed or the shape of the slope changed because the filter is obviously different. All right, so that, graphically that's kind of a nice feature to have. Um, Pretty nice. All right, so again, channel one, left tweeter, channel right, right tweeter, channel three, left midwoofer, channel four, right midwoofer, two channel active system. Uh, if I were to run a three way, I would have, I would use five and six. So if I had a three way system active, I would have channel one and two as the tweeters, channel three and four as the mid range, and channel five and six as the woofers, and seven and eight will be the subwoofer. Most serious audio files, um, this is all you need. You, you're not gonna run rear speakers. If you do, they're gonna be fill only. You're not gonna be using a DSP to try and EQ them um, for a two channel, you know, left, right, front stage. It's typically what people run. Um, if you have like a minivan where you have a, an entertainment system and you have children in the back, I do have rear speakers. Uh, and what I would do in this case like that is run them off the head unit's power, which is what I do. And then the DSP would control the front stage, the tweeter, and the midwoofer, and the subwoofer. Um, so. Um, just a quick run through again with the high and low pass filters and the shading. Uh, you probably didn't get a good view just in case. All right, if you can see that, I would click on that. There's my uh, high pass filter for my midwoofer. And if I click on that one, the high, the low pass filter, you can see the shading. Again, it's set on Liquids Rally right now. If I click on Butterworth, you can see that that change in the shading and the vessel. I'll leave it on like this really because that's the default one I like to use. Um, so if we want to uh, 
say we go through all the tuning, we set all high and low pass filters. Uh, I like to use Roo, uh, take a measurement with the microphone, use auto EQ to, as a, a base to start um, and load all of those filters in. All right, so you can see here I've loaded them all in. And now I wanna save this because I don't wanna lose all this work. So what you do is you click on file. And in this uh, drop down menu, you'll see load PC preset file and save as PC preset file. All right, so you, we'll click on save as. All right, and we'll just label this as test, test two. All right, and we'll save it. If I want to load it, okay, say I, I come back the next day, turn on the software, and I want to pull up what I saved the other day, okay, you can see I have, it's there. And I would just click on that, click open, and it would open it up. All right, so now, if I want to, um, well, this, this DSP has a memory, and I obviously want to load it and save it to the DSP itself. And then maybe later on, I could use the app on my phone, my iPad, and access that saved preset on the DSP through the app. I need to load it to the DSP. Another thing you can do is set uh, slightly different parameters with the same tune. So right now I have my Celestrian SB tune here. Let's say I want to change some of the high and low pass filters, maybe those, uh, the types of filters from say like what's Riley to Butterworth, um, maybe a shell filter, you know, something like that on the, on the subwoofer channel. Um, and then switch between those presets, Pre say I have preset one as Celestrian SB and preset two as, you know, I can label, you can label it whatever you want. And I want to switch between those two and see the difference. All right, so let's just say I, I'm going to go to the sub channel. All right, those are linked. And it's set for a Butterworth. I want to see how a Lightworks Riley sounds compared to a Butterworth. All right, and you can see there, when I switch them, you can see the difference. See that slope? See how it's steeper with the Butterworth? It's more of a shell filter than the Lightworks Riley. Um, starts earlier in the curve. Uh, and at the crossover frequency, it's down 6 dB versus 3. All right, so I want to see what the difference is, and I want to hear that on the presets. So I'm going to save that. Um, I would save it to the PC. I'm going to save it to the DSP. All right, so we're going to click Save as DSP Preset. And I'm going to click Preset 2 because that's the one I want to try. So compare it to the initial one on number one. Click Save. Here's where you can name it. I'm just going to put Test 2 for demonstration purposes here. Click OK. And now it's saved as Test 2. And that just got loaded to the DSP's memory. So now I can go back, say I have this in my car now, and I don't want to hook up the PC to it. I can access that same information because it's loaded into the DSP's memory with the app on the on your phone or the iPad. All right, um, and then we do the same thing here. Um, save it to the PC. So save as PC preset. Save it to your PC and your DSP at the same time, um, so you have a backup. All right, I'm trying to make this as short as possible, but I know that this DSP is going to attract a lot of first-time DSP buyers. And they're all going to want to know, what is a good baseline to start? Um, that I could talk about that for a long time. Um, typically, when you set your DSP, you want to set, you want to start with your tweeter. You need to know some specifications on it. Uh, the general rule of thumb is uh, you want to find the resonant frequency of that tweeter. It's indicated as FS and you want to do, you want to set your, uh, let's say you want to set your high pass filter 
so that it's two times whatever the FS is. So uh, a good place to start, a lot of tweeters <coughs> have an FS of around 1500 hertz. Um, so we want to set our tweeter for 3000. All right, um, so let's do that. We'll start with channel one. That'll be the left channel, 3000. All right. I always use 24, 24 dB octave filters. Um, you could actually go a little bit less than that with a 24 dB. That rule of thumb is with a 12 dB uh, filter. All right, so you can see here in the shaded area, that's all been, all that frequency has been removed now. So it's only gonna play uh, at the 3000 hertz mark because it's a Likowitz Riley filter. It'll be down 6 dB at that point and it's gonna play from there on up to, to whatever it can play to. And your human hearing can only hear to 20,000. The typical, actually most people can't hear past 18,000. And I, I can't really hear past about 17. So set your tweeter, uh, high pass filter to start at 3000. So there, there we have it. We'll, we'll call channel two our um, um, right tweeter. So again, like what's Riley, I'm gonna put 3000 in there. And I'm gonna set the slope to 24 dB, okay? Now, if you can see here, I'm gonna tilt that down just a little bit. You can see my cursor where it says IN1, IN2, 3, and 4. Those correspond with inputs. This DSP has four inputs. I'm gonna go back to channel one, and I know the left IN1 is, well, the, that's the white one I, I mentioned before, that I like to use that as a left. So I'm gonna select that. So that means now that the input, the IN or the left input is linked to channel one. Channel two, IN, that would be the red one on the one of the four uh, inputs on this DSP. I'm gonna link that to two. Okay, so that would be my typical um, two-way active crossover system. Channel three, That'll be for my left um, midwoofer. All right, so now I have uh, channel three selected. Um, and I wanna select a low pass filter that corresponds with the high pass filter on the tweeter. All right, so as we had shown you before, like what's rally is the go-to uh, filter I like to use. Um, and we had set the high pass filter on the tweeter at 3000. So we wanna do that for our midwoofer so they match. So I'm gonna type in 3000, 24 dB. All right, and you can see now, uh, let's zoom in a little closer. It's attenuated the midwoofer now at, so that it's six dB down at the 3000 Hertz point and everything up from there is filtered up because the tweeter will take over from that point. Okay, so there you have it. And I'm gonna link that to my input because it's my left input and I'm using one source or a left and right channel from the same source. All right, just like the tweeter, it's gonna be input one. Um, and then you don't want to have a midwoofer trying to play bass, subwoofer bass frequencies. So a good place to start for your midwoofer um, on a high pass filter, like what's really, is about 80 hertz. If you know the FS of your midwoofer, you typically don't want to go below the FS. You want to high pass it right at or just above the FS of the midwoofer or mid-range. All right, so there you can see now, you see the blue shaded area? 
and you can see now it's attenuated the frequencies it's 6 dB down at 80 Hertz and filters out everything lower than that and you can see the um, the high pass filter as well so we have this is what you call a band pass filter um, because we're filtering out low frequencies and high frequencies and only letting the stuff in between play so we're playing between 80 Hertz and 3000 Hertz on this midwoofer all right, so that's my left midwoofer. I'm gonna make channel four my right midwoofer. Uh, again, like with Riley. All right, all right. I'm gonna put 80 for the high pass filter, 24 dB, low pass filter, like with Riley. Match the tweeter, 3000, 24 dB. All right, there you go. So now we have our tweeters set, we have our midwoofer set, and if you have a subwoofer, um, you wanna set that. All right, so we're gonna use, channel. I like to use the last two as the subwoofer. All right, um, subwoofers are almost always a mono signal, but you'll have, out of your head unit, a left and a right. So what you do in a DSP is you link the two channels together because you don't want them to be separate or have different uh, settings from each other. They have to be the same. So we're going to link seven and eight together by clicking on those link buttons, the two like that. When I change seven, it'll automatically update eight so they, they work together. Um, and on the input of the DSP, all right, three and four uh, that will be you know from your head unit you'll have um, typically three RCA outputs you'll have front uh, rear which is the middle and sub all right as far as we're concerned we're going to use the front that's going to be our front stage and we're going to use the, the sub um, and we don't care about the middle because um, like I said before, rear speakers on a true sound quality system, most people don't even run them. And when they do, it's for fill only for like kids and stuff. Otherwise, it's just gonna screw up your uh, front stage and it's not gonna sound good. So, so we have, uh, we wanna set the low pass filter for the subwoofer. All right, so low pass means, um, that it's gonna allow all the, all the frequencies from wherever you set it down uh, pass by, okay? Uh, on a subwoofer, I like to set the, um, uh, the low pass filter so that's um, about a half an octave uh, less than what you set the high pass filter for the midwoofer, okay? So since we set our midwoofer at 80, we're going to set the low pass filter for the subwoofer at 60. All right. And I, unlike all of the other uh, filters where I use like what's Riley, I use a shelf filter on the sub. Um, uh, the reason for that is um, because we have a separation of about um, 20, 20, uh, well, we have a separation from 60 to 80 hertz. We have a little gap there. And if you don't do that, um, well, you do that because most people like to play the subwoofer between 10 and 20 decibels louder than the front stage. Um, that's just the way it is. If you try to set everything flat the same level, you're going to complain you have no bass. Um, so what I do is, and this is, everybody does this. Uh, this is just kind of common practice in the car audio world. Tuners of all kinds of like pretty much do this. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, put a little gap in between the sub and the midwoofer. Then you raise, uh, you raise the um, volume of the sub channel between 10 and 20 dB higher than the rest of it. 
Uh, and what that does is clo it closes the gap because even though you have you know, your sub set in a high pass of 60, uh, it's still playing frequencies after 60 hertz. It's just attenuating them at, well, it should be 24 dB, at 24 dB per octave after that set frequency. So because it's playing louder, it ends up closing the gap between the sub and the midwoofer and where they meet, they usually work out so that it, you don't have a sub playing mid-bass frequencies because that won't sound good. So trust me when I tell you, set your sub this way, it'll sound better. But the great thing about a DSP is, if you don't believe me, go ahead and try it. Do a like what's Riley, set it at the same, make it as a preset, you know, and then toggle back and forth between what I told you and what you think, and you'll see the difference. All right, so here we have it. Um, the other thing I, I need to mention too, on your subwoofer amplifier, you'll have um, the low pass crossover. Um, usually they go from a range of uh, like 40 hertz up to like 300 and something. When you're using a DSP, you want to take that high pass filter that's not defeatable on a mono subwoofer, subwoofer amplifier and raise it as high as it'll go. Um, you don't want that and the DSP's filter fighting with each other or you know competing with each other and screwing everything up. So raise that, say it goes to 320, raise it all the way up to 320 on the amplifier uh, and then let the DSP do the actual uh, attenuating which we have here set at 60 hertz. All right, so remember I said um, we wanted to have the subwoofer play between 10 and 20 dB louder than your midwoofer and tweeters. Um, so on this uh, software, uh, the way you can do that is you go to the mixer and remember how we had linked our tweeters and our woofers to the same two inputs, input one and two. So here you see in the mixer we have input one and two. So what I want to do is set those so that they're 15 dB less than my sub. So that's what I'm going to do. Must have forgot to link the woofer here. Yes, I did. All right, so I forgot to link channel four for the midwoofer. All right, so I'm going to link it to the right side because that's my right midwoofer. Go back to the mixer. There it is. Make that 85. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm lowering the output of the tweeter and the midwoofers so that 15 dB less than what the sub's going to play. All right. Another way, well, let me, let me say, when I lowered the front stage 15 dB, that was assuming you set your gains and your amplifiers so that everything played the same level. Another way you can do it is to raise the gain on the amplifier as long as you have enough headroom and you don't run into clipping so that it is playing 15 dB higher than your front stage. That's completely up to you. Um, typically you set all your gains on your amplifiers first, make them all the same. Um, and then you go into the DSP and tune from there. All right, the last thing I want to show you is the time alignment. All right, so we'll click on inches here. All right, go to channel one. And we will measure. So remember, channel one was my left tweeter, channel two is my right tweeter, channel three is my left midwoofer, channel four is my right midwoofer. And seven and eight are linked, and those are the subwoofers. 
So we would get our tape measure out. We would then measure from each driver in the car separately uh, from the center of the speaker to where, where your, the driver's head's going to be to the exact same spot for each driver where the driver's head's going to be. And then we would input that number all right, using the inch value here. Uh, we'll just make stuff up. Say the left tweeter is 30 inches away and the right tweeter is 45 inches away. All right, and the left midwoofer is 40 inches away and the right midwoofer is 50 inches away. Okay, and then we measure to our sub and let's say uh, it's my minivan that's really far away. It's eight feet, so I'm gonna put 96 inches away. It's really not that much, but um, just for demonstration purposes. So that's how you would start uh, doing the baseline tune here for your DSP um, and setting your time delay. A lot of uh, you know, a lot of people have aftermarket head units. Uh, and they all work, they work the same way. You, you measure to your drivers and you input that directly into your head unit. This works the same way. So some people might be familiar with this, some may not, but to get a bass tune, that's where you start. Um, you can also go online uh, and find some calculators that'll tell you how many milliseconds um, if you input the distance and you can just click on milliseconds here or centimeters if this is you know not the US or you're in the metric system um, it's just a nice option to have um, you can do this a whole you know many different ways and that's the whole point of a digital signal processor it gives you crazy almost infinite adjustability um, so there you have it this is you know a good base tune uh, from which to start, you know, if you were going to start a two-way active system, um, you know, in a two-way active system, I like to try and cross the tweeter to the midwoofer um, as low as I can without straining the tweeter. Uh, the lower you go, the less power you can put on the tweeter and the more distortion the tweeter is going to produce because it's a small driver and it doesn't produce lower frequencies as well as higher frequencies. So that's a compromise you're going to have to find out. But again, like I said, start with the FS of the tweeter, two times the FS, start there and then go from there. You know, you, do, you don't want to go one and a half times the FS, even with a 24 dB like what's Riley. I've never done it. Some people might say you can, but I wouldn't go any further than, than that. Um, and that should give you, you know, a good base tune of which to start with. Um, and then if you can download Room EQ Wizard, get a uh, calibrated microphone that works with that software and learn how to use that. I will do a separate YouTube video for that. Um, that would give you just about as good of a tuning tool as the pros use. I mean, it's really, really powerful RTA. Um, you know, make a donation to the uh, to the people who uh, you know started Roo. It would, you know helps out. This is, it's a great service, um, great software, very, very powerful. Um, if you can learn how to use an RTA with this DSP, you can take any system, and I've taken systems with stock speakers and made them sound incredible, you know, compared to what they sounded like in stock. Um, just by adding an amplifier and a digital signal processor to it and changing nothing else really. Um, tweeters, maybe you want to change those, but the midwoofers they usually play the mid-range frequencies pretty well. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. It's, it's you know, it's, it's amazing the difference that a DSP can make in the sound quality of a system. If I were to say, you know, what modification, single modification in your system would make the biggest difference, and I've done, you know, a lot of things. I've been doing this for 20 years, but I've been to DSPs now for a year and a half. Um, 
This is easily the best modification, the single best modification I've ever made to my system. Huge difference. Um, it just, it's just incredible uh, how technology has you know, gotten to this point where now you can buy a DSP for $150. Um, you know, and I bought that JL Tweak, you know, which, I mean, granted, it is better, but it's, you know, and it has a few more bells and whistles and a few more fail-safes, and it has more inputs and outputs, but, you know, for the basic uh, two-way active front stage with subwoofer, this Dayton DSP is all you need. And I've, you know, I've compared it in my car, I've been listening to them, swapping them back and forth. Can't tell the difference. There's no noise, the noise floors, you know, in either one, I can't even hear it. Um, really, really good DSP. This is like fantastic for this price. This is easily the best bang for the buck DSP on the market right now. I'm really impressed with it. Um, and I'm taking into consideration the price. You know, like I said, the, J the JL, not locking the JL. Uh, I love my JL DSP. The software is definitely better on the JL DSP. Especially, you know, if you're brand new to DSPs and you have the money, I would go with the JL. But if you have, you know, the wherewithal and the, the means and you want to learn, you know, you want to put the time in to learn how to use one and you, you know, you don't have the money for the JL, or let's just say you're more you're a more advanced uh, user, but you know maybe you're into Helix or you know these other mega buck DSPs. Um, this Dayton Audio DSP for me, I mean it's just it's a no brainer. I mean this thing is this thing's awesome. I mean I, I can't believe this thing's only 150 bucks. This is a really good DSP for 150 dollars. This thing is. Now, this thing is setting the new, a new standard, a new benchmark in DSPs. Um, I just, I can't say it enough. This is like, this is huge. So, uh, hopefully this helps you out. I, um, I hopefully I, you know, didn't spend too much time on here. And somebody can look at this video and learn how to use it. How to change the presets. Push the knob. Select the preset, push the knob again, and then it switches over to that preset. I'm going to switch back to another preset, select another one, push the knob, and when you hear the audio come back, it's on the next preset. $180. Hundred and nine degrees in the car and testing it for about 20 minutes. It is 90 degrees ambient. Okay, I've been swapping these DSPs back and forth just by unplugging them and plugging them back in with the Dayton and the Tweak. And I did find one small con. I was mostly concerned about the noise floor between the two and um, there's no difference except when I plug this thing in. So I don't know if you can hear it, but when I plug it in I get an audible noise floor. I don't know if you heard that, but when I unplug it, it goes away. Plug it back in. If I can get it to plug in. There it is again. So that's it plugged in. You hear it? That's with it unplugged. That's with it plugged. Unplugged. So. <laughs> This little remote, uh, when it's plugged into the Dayton DSP, introduces some noise into the system. You know, I guess it's... I'm a little surprised, to be honest with you, but... Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. 
this thing's kind of useless um, because a lot of the things that you can do, you can do with the app. Uh, you really don't need this. So this thing is kind of redundant, but just needed to make that known. Okay, so here I took some rue measurements, one with the Dayton DSP and one with the JL Tweak. Um, I tried to set the levels uh, exactly the same. Obviously they measured a little bit different, but the curves are pretty darn close. Um, yes, it needs some work in the tuning. I'm disregarding that. Um, so as you can see, uh, the red line is the Dayton DSP. It looks like uh, the level of the sub is a little bit lower and the tweeters are a little bit higher. And the blue line is the JL Audio, which is that there that's highlighting. Um, so that one has the subs a little bit stronger and the tweeters are a little bit less in volume. Those are just minor adjustments. Otherwise, as you can see here, they're, you know, with the parametric EQs uh, set in each DSP the same, they modeled the same. So that's a good sign. So to conclude this video, um, my thoughts on this Dayton DSP taking its price into consideration. Um, you can get just as good a results with this Dayton DSP as you can with the JL as far as tuning wise. Um, a couple of cons I've, I've noticed. <coughs> the remote introduces noise or a higher noise floor. Um, a slight buzz in the background. Um, kind of disappointing on that but uh, it's not something that uh, is a make or break deal for me anyway. Uh, I don't think it's something that is necessary and if I were to buy this I would probably not knowing this now I wouldn't get this uh, remote uh, with the Bluetooth dongle and the app you can change presets and do everything or if you want it's a little inconvenient but you could just plug and unplug this um, but it does introduce like I said noise into the system I also noticed a little bit of uh, noise uh, <coughs> when um, opening and closing doors and things like that. <clears throat> Nothing that's, it's, it's barely there, but I do notice it. Uh, other than that, sound quality wise, um, without, with this remote not connected, this thing sounds fantastic. Um, so there you go. Uh, I recommend it for 150 bucks, you can't go wrong. If I were to choose between the tweak in the Dayton DSP, knowing what I know now, uh, I'd still go with the JL Tweak if I had the money. Or if I was a beginner and I had never used the DSP before and I wanted something, in my opinion, it's a little easier to learn uh, the JL than it is the Dayton. Um, but if you're willing to put in a little more effort, uh, a little bit less convenient, but still get good results but with a lot less money the Dayton DSP is as good as it gets right now so I give this thing uh, my recommendation